Hi everyone, so this is going to be the last of the uh, Bohr model video and in this video I really just want to walk you through another example of doing calculations with the Bohr equations. Remember that there's two of them, the energy of the um, a given orbit versus and the other one is the energy of the electronic transition which remember that you can relate that to the energy of the photon that's being emitted or absorbed by the electron as a result of um, the transfer of the electron from one orbit to another. So question number two um, is asking how much energy is lost if an electron go from the n equals 4 orbit to the n equals 2 orbit again of a hydrogen atom and what wavelength of light will be emitted by this electron when it makes this transition. Um, and just as a reminder that that's what happens right when you, you, when you get an electron to go from a higher to a lower orbit that's when we see um, a release of energy by the electron and that energy is um, released in the form of photon. Okay, so going back to the question, it's asking us to calculate the energy that the electron loses from going from 4 to 2. So uh, if I move this to the scratch paper here, you can see that um, our n initial therefore is 4, right? It's going from 4 and then our n final is 2. So to calculate the energy that's released, you just need to calculate the delta E component. So remember that delta E um, is in this case going from 4 to 2, so you can write it 4, um, 4 here, going to 2. And if that's the case, then, oops, sorry, there shouldn't be an equal sign. Uh, that should equal to negative RH, which remember in this case would be our uh, energy unit, because we're calculating energy here on the left side, 1 over uh, N uh, final squared, so n final is 2, so 2 squared minus 1 over n initial squared, okay? So if you calculate this number together, uh, all together you should get negative 4.084 times 10 to the minus 19 joule. So the negative here is actually quite important because uh, if you remember for from topic six, when we say that delta E is negative, uh, when it's less than zero, that implies that energy is released by the system, right? In this case, energy is released by the system because the system is the atom. The atom consists of nucleus and electron. And in this case, when the electron goes from a higher level or orbit to a lower level orbit, it's releasing energy and that is um, given by this value right here, negative 4.08 times 10 to minus joule minus 19 joules. So the negative really implies an, a release of energy. Now, uh, the second question in this problem is asking about the wavelength of light that's emitted as a result of this transition. So for this, you have to remember back that this delta E here, right, the delta E of the electronic transition, okay, so if we go back here, the delta E of the electronic transition is equal to the energy of the photon that's emitted. Okay, now the energy of the photon is equal to hc over lambda. So you can think of this, if you want to think about system and surrounding, you can think about this being the system and it's releasing this energy and the surrounding being the photon. So the photon is absorbing that energy. So in other words, the photon, the energy of the photon itself is positive 4.084 times 10 to minus 19 joule. Okay, so you can think about it that way. So the energy of the photon itself, because the photon is absorbing that energy, is positive. 4.084 times um, 10 to the minus 19 joules, and that has to equal to hc over lambda, which means that if I want to solve for lambda, which is what the question asks, if I want to solve for lambda, that means that lambda is just going to be equal to uh, hc, h is Planck's constant, so I'm just going to write that out here, negative uh, 10 to the minus 34 joules second, and then um, the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meter per second. And then I have the this over the energy is going to give me lambda, right? So then this is 4.084 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. If you see right now, the joules will cancel. The per second and the second will cancel. Of course, what you get in the end is this a unit that's corresponding to meter, which is the unit of of length, okay? Your answer should be 4.86 or 87 times 10 to the minus 7 meter 
And remember that this is expressed usually in terms of uh, nanometers, so then you get 487 nanometers. Uh, if, if you remember the region, uh, the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum, this is right in the visible region. It's probably a color that corresponds a little bit to um, blue, a uh, little bit bluish color. Uh, and you can actually check this out if you remember that diagram um, that I showed before about the emission spectra of the uh, hydrogen uh, atom, you notice that one of the lines correspond to this color right here, which is blue. And that exactly, if you were to calculate that, would give you a value of 486.1, which is close enough to what we calculated. We calculated a value of about 487. Okay, so that's what uh, the what you're able to do now. So in other words, that that color that you see in the emission spectra correspond to the transition of an electron in the hydrogen atom from the n equals 4 orbit to the n equals 2 orbit. Okay, the last concept I want to talk about uh, real quick here is just in terms of the negative value that's given in the equation that Bohr uses to um, uh, calculate the energy of an electron in orbit. So the question is, why why is there a negative? Um, and because remember that if you have the negative, that means that the first energy level, which is the ground state level, has a negative energy, it's negative RH, right? And then if you go to infinity, which is the furthest away you can go in, in an atom, then you have a uh, value that's zero, okay? So the idea there is just basically kind of a different way of defining a reference value. If, if you think about usually in, in terms of reference value, right? Let me just go to a scratch paper here to illustrate what I mean. If you think about a reference value, uh, the reference value, if you think about height, for example, okay? We define this as height equals zero, which is the ground level, and then we define, uh, you know, everything else is measured against that level, right? So if I have an object at this height, for example, I would say that that object, say a triangle, for example, would have a, a height that's corresponding to uh, a certain height measured by the um, uh, relative to the reference value, okay? And then if I have another object here, then the height would be, again, relative to the reference value. So in this particular case, it's really the same, except that your reference value is sort of, if you think about height again as an analogy, the reference value now is the ceiling, okay, or some level that's at the, at the top. So then if I have that same object, let's say this is my reference value and define this as zero, okay? If I define this height as zero, that means that same object, that same triangle, okay, is now measured relative to that reference value and it's going to have a negative value, right? It's gonna be negative whatever that number is, okay? So in fact, you're gonna get a negative height as a result of it. You can think of this also as, you know, objects under the C, uh, they have, with, ref with respect to the reference value has a negative height because the negative the the reference value is defined as C level as opposed to you know the bottom of the C okay so really when we're talking about um, when we're talking about the uh, energy of the electron in the hydrogen atom we're talking about the same thing we define the energy to be equal to zero when the electron is completely uh, off the atom. In other words, where it's completely ionized. Now, why does that make, make sense? Well, if you think about it, the energy that the electron experiences, okay, so if, if this is my uh, nucleus, okay, and here's my electron, the energy that the electron experiences is this electrostatic or coulombic interaction between a positive and a negative charge, right? When the electron is very far away at distance equals infinity, okay, then of course this interaction gets weaker and weaker and eventually the interaction is no longer there, okay? Uh, it's sort of like if you think about gravitational attraction between the Earth and some other object, the further away the object is from the surface of the Earth, from the center of the Earth, then the, the weaker that gravitational attraction is. So at some point, there's no longer any gravitational attraction. The same idea here, at some point, there's no longer any electrostatic interaction. So we define that level as being equal to zero. We say that at that point, there's no interaction, so the level is zero. However, as you get closer and closer and closer to nucleus, right, if the electron is here, there's clearly some interaction. If the electron is here, there is very strong interaction, okay?
there's very strong interaction with the nucleus. So really what we're saying is that as you get closer to the nucleus, the electrons become sta more stable and the energy becomes more negative. Remember that lower numbers mean um, more stable energy. So that's really kind of the idea of that negative number. That's why the energy of the uh, electron at a particular energy level is given as negative RH over n square and if there's a negative sign there because that's the way we define the uh, energy levels okay okay so I want to uh, end this discussion on the Bohr model by this by talking about that the fact that the Bohr model even though we took quite a bit of time to discuss is actually not the model that we're going to end up using in the end to talk about properties of atoms and the reason is because the Bohr model actually fails when it's used to calculate the properties of systems with more than one electron. Um, so if you think about the hydrogen atom, as I mentioned earlier, the reason that it was, you know, Bohr studied that system to begin with is because it, it's the simplest system that you can possibly look at, which is one electron system. Okay, so this is when we differentiate between something that has only one electron and something that has more than one electron, which we call polyelectronic systems. Now, everything else in the periodic table, if you think about it, is really polyelectronic systems because even starting from helium, lithium, and so on, they all have more than one electron in them. Okay, now as it turns out, the Bohr model only works if you're applying those equations that we just learned to things uh, or systems with one electron which is hydrogen atom that's the first one that we looked at earlier in a lot of detail but things like helium plus lithium two plus all of these are one electron systems right if you think about it helium has two electrons if you have a helium plus ion that means that it only has one electron uh, and there is reasons for this the reason is basically that the Bohr model cannot account for electron electron interaction which we need to talk about when we get to the quantum uh, theory itself okay now the reason that you know the so the Bohr model works only for this one electron system where there is no other electron in the atom or the ion okay however it does work for this type of system so we study it uh, the main reason we study the Bohr model at this point is really to kind of uh, appreciated for the fact that the Bohr was the first person to come up with this idea that energy of the electron needs to be quantized. In other words, the electron can only occupy certain energy level. It cannot be all over the atom. Okay, so that's really something that Bohr came up with, something that's new, and that led eventually to quantum mechanics, that uh, the idea that the electron can only be found in certain energy uh, states or certain energy level. Now, the Bohr equation itself could be used to calculate properties of things like helium plus or lithium two plus and so on, but you have to modify the equation a little bit. If you remember, in the hydrogen atom case, the energy of each um, uh, orbit or Bohr orbit is given as ne negative Rh, 1 over n square. That 1 really stands for the atomic number or the number of protons that the um, that the system has okay so the hydrogen atom only has one proton that's why the number at the top there is one so it's one squared but really the more general version of Bohr's equation should be negative r it's z square over n square where z is the atomic number so if you remember back from topic two we call z the atomic number which is equal to the number of protons that the nucleus has or that the atom has in this case so if you have a larger nucleus let's say you have two protons or three protons like in the case of helium plus or lithium two plus then that number would be more than one so it would be two squared three squared four squared and so on okay and that's important to understand because we're going to do some calculations with this form of the equation in class but it's important to understand because the more protons you have and if you still have one electron you would imagine that the electrostatic interaction between the electron and proton should be stronger and in fact that's the case and that's given by this equation okay all right so that's the end of the whole concept about Bohr the Bohr model and atomic emission spectra this has been a long um, series of videos discussing the different concepts related to the Bohr model but I hope you get a really good picture of what uh, you know what the Bohr model is and how it could be used to explain atomic emission spectra